Gary Gibbon has been the political editor of Channel 4 News since 2005, having previously held the position of political, political correspondent. He has received numerous accolades throughout his career, such as the Royal Television Society Home News Award in 2006, which he won along with his colleague Jon Snow, following his story on the Attorney General's legal advice on Iraq. He also won the Political Broadcaster of the Year Award from the Political Studies Association in 2008. He has covered multiple general elections and is currently heavily involved in reporting on Brexit. To whom do you feel that journalists are chiefly responsible? The punters, the readers, the viewers, definitely. There's a, some people, I think, who think they're probably responsible to their boss or their client. ITN is a programme that makes Channel 4 News for Channel 4. So you're always thinking, you know, does the channel like what we're doing? But the channel is trying to make it a product that serves the public and fulfils a need that's out there that other programmes aren't doing. So fundamentally it's about doing something that serves your viewers and does it in a way that not everybody else does, I think. Um, do you believe that competition between news stations has the capacity to inspire reckless journalism? Not of itself. We were the competition once. Channel 4 waded in uh, not so long ago in the whole scale of broadcasting history. And I like to think we help matters. Um, no, I don't think of itself competition is a bad thing at all. And what we're seeing at the moment as well, uh, some of the better outlets online are incredibly sharp and fast and trying to be accurate and they're well funded and some of them have paywalls and subscription things which I think makes it difficult for young people always to follow them but there, there are the, the competition sometimes can be a force for good I don't think there's a blanket way of looking at competition and saying that it, it, it's bad uh, I think if you go all the way back to when it was just the BBC reading out the news in black bow ties um, you probably would think they benefited from competition and it made them more challenging I think they would accept that as well so really limited competition is bad news and competition of itself is not bad news. Thank you. Do you think that it is appropriate to publicise the private lives of politicians? Do you think it's relevant to um, the public interest? I think if there is rank hypocrisy in play and you are let's say I'm going to hop to another continent rather than talk about our own but if you're an American preacher politician uh, who's running for high office and your own and you're running on a holier than thou ticket and your private life is a monstrous mess and it's uh, you've been treating people badly and not abiding by all the rules you're telling everybody you should be abided by I think that's a, a prime example of where your private life is relevant I think there are lots and lots of cases where it's many more, um, and particularly in British politics, where it's completely irrelevant. But fortunately, we live in an age when some of the things people would have been most scandalised by, like being divorced um, uh, or, or being gay, those things are not stigmatised in the way that they were or those people still can un undergo great hardship in, in trying to deal with them, but they, they're not stigmatised in the same way, so the pressure is less, and I couldn't be less interested in whether a politician, um, mm. or wh who they're sleeping with or who they're attracted to. You touched on this a bit in your talk, but in your opinion, are television impartiality laws in the UK too restrictive for televised journalism? No, I don't think they're too restrictive. I think they're... Um, I think they're incredibly valuable and we should look after them. I think what we as journalists have got to be careful about is how we interpret them. And the example that I think is most in my mind is the way that um, those of us who are governed by rules of impartiality covered the referendum. I think we felt that the, we had to be very, very careful that the tone of the coverage of both sides was exactly matching. And I think we somewhat forgot that we had to use equal rigour whenever we were challenging either side. And those two things don't always get you to the same place. And I think the primary thing we should have uh, uh, worked on is the rigour. And I don't think we did. I think there was a, 
Uh, we've got to be very fair and balanced and therefore we shouldn't challenge too hard a sort of pullback um, that happened. And I think, if I'm honest, I think there were mistakes made um, at the BBC, which I'm a big fan of, um, where they thought, oh, well, we let, we had leave, um, we had remain at the top of the bulletin on the eight o'clock news last night, say whatever happens, we'll make sure that the top story tonight is something that leave want to have there. And that can lead to an incredible skewing of, of things. I'll give you one example. The, um, there's a very uh, long respected uh, think tank called the Institute for Fiscal Studies, which had done a painstaking report on the cost of Brexit. And in, I heard a BBC bulletin which, instead of leading on the content of that report, which was a moment in the campaign, we sit around waiting after budgets and lots of bits of British life and elections for what is the IFS going to say. Instead of leading with that, they led with the fact that someone on the Brexit side, as it happens it was Ian Duncan Smith, uh, from memory, said, uh, accused them of taking EU money and being biased. And then they started discussing what the uh, reporters said. Well, that, that, that was just a, a, a bit of, I think Ian Duncan Smith himself would admit, a bit of a sort of, just a political swipe. The considered piece of work was the news and I think and in cases like that, you can see how uh, I think our rules are really important. I think it's good they're there, but we've got to be really careful how we interpret them. Um, and as a result of what you've just said, um, do you think that these laws should be imposed in other countries such as the US? Um, I, I find it really hard to imagine the US can put it all back together again. Uh, there were rules on balance until 1987, and they were that wall was pushed down. I think it's, I, I, uh, I think it would be beneficial, but it's probably far-fetched. How easy is it to report on issues such as Brexit, which really polarise the British public, without displaying any personal bias? It's not so much the personal bias that's difficult, it's the sense that they think you've got personal bias, which is, I think, the toughest thing to overcome. The, the punters are so divided, they're sniffing out your opinions everywhere on, on, on Brexit in a way that they don't normally uh, normally they give you the benefit of the doubt that you are trying to be impartial and fair. But on, on Brexit, uh, this happened a little bit as well in the Scottish independence referendum. In neither case particularly to me, as I recall, but to lots of colleagues who were being, uh, I, th I think, struggling to be, uh, really trying to be, aspiring to be um, impartial and fair and balanced. Uh, they were being accused all the time of favouring one side or the other. Um, in most cases favouring the Union in Scotland and favouring Remain, um, the two elite causes as people saw it um, in the referendum, in the Brexit referendum. So I don't find it that difficult except that people are really on your case. <laughs> Has journalism and in particular the political aspect satisfied your career ambitions? Um, I couldn't be happier. Um, it's fascinating. It's very changeable, unpredictable. Long periods of my career, I've looked at politics and I've been able to ring up my boss and say, I know what's going to happen, not just next month, but next year, the election in two, three years' time. It's just been so clear. The majority is so big, you can't turn it round. Blair's second election, you know, there was no, there was no question what was going to happen. Now, I couldn't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, with certainty. Uh, so it's that bit's sort of challenging. I miss the certainty to it up to a point, but the uncertainty is fascinating, and trying to keep across it is really stimulating. It's like being back at school or trying to learn a foreign language from scratch. Mm -hmm.